everybody. A uh, couple of questions I've had uh, from a few of you. What exactly will you have on the exam in terms of PKA table and the periodic table and so on? I've posted the actual PKA table that I put on the exam on the content page of Learning Suite so you can see what's there. What's not, of course, are the minus 2 and 16 PKAs I told you to memorize. Uh, let's see. And you won't have anything in terms of the nomenclature, so you'll have to know the suffixes and the prefixes. But again, it's a multiple choice test, so it's uh, the kind of question you can expect on nomenclature is, which of the following is name the molecule and then which of the following is I draw a structure of a molecule and then you pick the name and then which uh, and then uh, let's see which of the following molecules is this name and you have to see the name and you have to pick the structure uh, so it's worth knowing suffixes and prefixes uh, it's not worth spending a huge amount of time on all right so we need to spend a couple more minutes talking about um, fats and oils. Uh, I realize we're a little bit behind, but I just can't <laughs> resist. Um, last time we had mentioned that this long chain fatty acid that can be isolated from fats and oils, let's see, always has an even number of carbons, two, four, six, eight, ten, Okay, this is a 16 carbon chain. Uh, it can be isolated from various fats and it's got a polar head group and then a nonpolar tail group. And if you sort of imagine how water would respond to this molecule, we mentioned this briefly last time, this the shape over all of this molecule is sort of conical. And so if you imagine uh, taking some of these and lining them up together, let's see. Uh, over time, that conical structure is going to cause some curvature, and you're going to get a sphere that is polar on the outside. So, oops, that's not good. Ooh, that's what I need to do there. Make things a little faster, okay. Um, we're just going to pretend we're only looking at part. Uh, and of course, there would be sort of water out here. But you have the nonpolar group on the, in the interior uh, and nonpolar groups in the interior, and this is how soap works. This is why soap is able to wash away grease. Um, you'll see when I show you the structure of fats and oils, why our ancestors used to make soap from fats and oils. Uh, and of course, there's lots of different soaps and uh, detergents nowadays, but they all have the same basic structure, a nonpolar, or I sorry, a polar head group that can interact with water really well, and a nonpolar tail group that can't. And remember that burying nonpolar surface area is important to reduce, uh, is important to freeing up water to have more entropy. Okay, another, uh, and I think I mentioned last time and asked you to think about another type of. Um, something that looks similar to this, uh, but has some important differences in shape. And I think I told you about, I'm not actually going to draw it again. Huh. There it is. This is phosphatidylcholine. Do you need to memorize the structure of phosphatidylcholine? Only if you want to get a good grade on the exam. What? Come on, I can't joke. <laughs> Please do not memorize structures. Um, we were, I was talking with a few of you in my office on Friday and we sort of envisioned a joke question as the final question on the exam wherein I present 
the horrible, horrible uh, large structure and that you have no idea and I tell you to name it. And one of the options on the multiple choice is simply no. <laughs> and I think that would be really funny, but I also think that it would play with some of your brains too much and you would, in general on my exams, don't try to get inside my head because there's really not, there's no point in gaming the system. Um, like some people have in the past chosen to, let's see, I'm pretty sure this is the right answer, but I wonder if he's trying to trick me, so I'm going to choose the wrong answer just in case. That's almost always a bad strategy, so please don't do that. Okay, almost, okay, fine. It is always a bad strategy. All right, so phosphatidylcholine has two nonpolar tails and a polar head group. Uh, this is one of the phospholipids that's involved in your membranes. There's other different types of head groups. But uh, what is a membrane? Well, it's a lipid bilayer. And probably if you've had some sort of biology class before, you've seen someone draw something like this. And uh, when they draw that, they just are not wanting to draw all the bonds. But this is what they mean. Now, think about the difference in shape. This is sort of cylindrical in shape, whereas the soaps are more conical in shape. What that means is that when the phospholipids try to self-associate in order to decrease their exposure to water, uh, they can't curve around as quickly because of their cylindrical shape as do the surfactants or the, or the detergents. And so what you end up with is a layer of phospholipids that are associated side by side, but that only does you so much good uh, because of course you've got the one side with the entirely nonpolar tails. Oh. Mm -hmm. Dang it. Okay, move first, then shrink. And so uh, this would not, I mean, if you're just floating around in water and you've got water on both sides of this, you've still got a huge amount of nonpolar surface area exposed to water. And so what nature does is it takes two of these leaflets and brings them together like that, and that's the lipid bilayer. So that creates the opportunity, and over time, this will, if you think on a vast scale in sort of three dimensions, uh, after a while the lipid bilayer can start to curve back on itself, and you have, uh, you have the basic boundaries of a cell where there is an outside that is in water, and there is an inside that's also exposed to water, but they're two different areas. And membranes are really critically important in biology. Um, they were separate us from not us. So um, anything you want to know about that or any questions you have? What's your name, that again? Or is that how many are the lip No, you don't need to know this name. It's clearly non-systematic, right? Yeah. Um, You just need to know the idea that they self-associate to bury the nonpolar surface area so it's not exposed to water. And, and we explained that process, uh, that we explained the reasons for that last time and, and that's a, a good thing to know and review. All right, um, I brought some fats and oils here. Uh, we have here Skippy. Um, which is, don't you hate it that they do this now? You got some concavity at the bottom and so that it looks like you're buying more than you actually are. It's like, I'm not an idiot. And I'll pay more for that extra little bit of peanut butter, just anyway. So uh, this is all uniform. If we opened it up, you wouldn't need to stir it. Uh, this on the other hand, uh, I don't know, can you hear that? It's, uh, 
it's got it's got regular it's got sort of this these solids towards the bottom and it's got this oily layer at the top uh, and this is Adam's 100% natural <laughs> peanut butter. Um, we're going to talk about why it's that way. Uh, so you have things that are solid. We have coconut oil here, which is actually a solid at room temperature. I don't know if it can actually be called oil, more like coconut <laughs> solid. I don't know. Uh, butter, which is... Uh, a solid, and then you have all of these various oils. Let's see, olive oil here, Crisco, pure vegetable oil from what? From soybean oil. Okay, this is soybean oil. This is peanut oil. I guess Chick fil A uses peanut oil, right? This is canola oil. I don't know what a canola is. And these are tostadas, <laughs> um, which also have some oil in them. And I, this is, this is important. I'll talk about this in just a minute. Um, but fats and oils sh share the same basic structure. Uh, again, you don't need to know or memorize the structure. But I do want you to be able to explain some differences in their physical properties. So a triglyceride has two different portions. You've got the glycerol portion here. I guess we're using that color for something else. Glycerol is a three carbon alcohol with OH groups on each of the carbons. And then you have this portion, uh, which we're going to call a long chain fatty acid. It's a carboxylic acid uh, that is bonded to glycerol via what kind of functional group? Ester, Ester very good. Um, long chain fatty acid. I, you know, dr we, dr we drew one of those one of these was one of those long chain fatty acids in its carboxylic acid form. Um, and so, as an example, maybe we'll just draw one of these groups. Uh, two, four, three, four, six, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So this is an 18 carbon chain. And in regular triglycerides, that's the sort of technical term for these things, you will have, sometimes they will have different fatty acids on each oxygen. And there's a lot of variation in the structure of the fatty acid. Um, triglyceride is another word for fats and oils. And both of them are triglycerides. Fats are solid at room temperature. Oils are liquid at room temperature. So, um, I want to show you briefly some of the physical properties of the fatty acids and what we learn here will apply to the triglycerides as well. So a class of fatty acids that have uh, all of the carbons with as many hydrogens as they can have. Two carbon, uh, each carbon is bonded twice to carbon and twice to uh, hydrogen. We call those saturated fatty acids. And I'm going to list here their melting points uh, and number of carbons. We're just going to look at trends here. Um, because I know some of you like me to, um, maybe you don't, I don't know. Some of you like me to make it explicit what you don't need to know. I'm here signing in my own blood um, that you don't have to memorize melting points. Okay? And, and we've got... It's still dripping. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so let's see, 12, 16, 18, 20. And the melting points go up from 43 to 63 to 69 to 77. Uh, OK, tell me why melting point is increasing. Yes? Uh, two reasons. First one is the surface area is increasing. Okay. Good, surface area increases, 
as the number of carbons increase. Yeah? More non-covalent interaction, yes. Melting point, so the way you think about temperature may need to change. In the, at the molecular level, temperature is just how much kinetic energy the molecule has. And so uh, melting point is really a question of the kinetic energy on average that molecules have, whether or not it can overcome the potential energy provided by the non-covalent interactions to keep the molecules together. So yes, as you increase the surface area, you're increasing the van der Waals interactions and therefore you increase the melting point or you need more kinetic energy to overcome the uh, stronger interactions. Okay, uh, now let's look at some unsaturated fatty acids of similar length. Unsaturated means at some place there's going to be a double bond. And in natural fats and oils that have these double bonds, the double bonds are cis, always. And there are enzymes that control that. So uh, I'm going to write the number of carbons here. The presence of a double bond, I'm writing the configuration here, which is Z or cis. Notice that for the fully saturated uh, fatty acid at 16 carbons, the melting point is 63 degrees Celsius. That means it remains solid on a hot day anywhere on Earth. Okay? Well, I don't know. Does it ever get up to 63 Celsius somewhere? Probably not. Yeah. Um, we traveled to Europe once, and it was weird to ha try to figure out I had to remember the only two numbers I know in Celsius are 37, which is body temperature, and 25, which is supposedly room temperature. So I now, I now know if it's over 37, it's really hot. Um, anyway, the melting point for this fatty acid is zero. That means that's a liquid even when water freezes. Um, and uh, we can add even more carbons but still keep that double bond and the melting point doesn't uh, increase by that much. We're still, uh, we're still only, uh, we're still liquid at room temperature. And if you incorporate a second double bond, this would be a polyunsaturated fatty acid. These would be monounsaturated. Um, you're looking at below zero. Uh, an 18 carbon chain with three double bonds at carbons 9, 12, and 15 respectively uh, is a liquid down to minus 60. And then this one's kind of fun. Uh, 5Z, 8Z, 11Z, and 14Z. Uh, this one's a liquid down to minus 50. Uh, so... I'll just draw you the structure of one of these. It's um, this one, which happens to be called linolenic acid. I don't know if, if those words will ever mean anything, and it, I think I, I can't imagine it coming up. Um, sorry, I'm having to draw it from my notes because I don't have the structure memorized. What? Okay. I need to check and make sure we got even. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Good. Uh, so this is an 18 carbon chain. It's got double bonds involving nine, carbon 9, carbon 12, and carbon 15. Excuse me, this is an example of what is called an omega-3 fatty acid. And why is it called omega-3? It's not because there's three double bonds. Um, it's because sometimes organic chemists with um, long carbon chains start at the first carbon. Uh, here's a carboxylic acid. 
uh, that's carbon one, and then this is the alpha carbon or the carbon next to it. This is the beta carbon, this is the gamma carbon, this is the delta carbon, and at that point, we start not being so good anymore at the alphabetical order of the Greek alphabet, so we shrug our shoulders and say, whatever, this will be carbon omega, because that's the last one. And uh, we call this an omega-3 fatty acid because starting with omega, there's a double bond, three carbons from the end, okay? Uh, so you've heard about omega-3 fatty, fatty acids. These are unsaturated fatty acids. They're associated with various health benefits. And back when eggs weren't so expensive, you could, uh, people would try to advertise or get you to buy their eggs by telling you they were rich in omega fatty acids, which I presume means they just fed the chickens a bunch of fat that had uh, omega-3s in it. Um, but that's what they're talking about. Most probably the marketers who are advertising this have no idea what this means, but now you do. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's talk about uh, some of the oil composition. Uh, and I'm gonna show you, talk about three different kinds of uh, fats and oils from various biological sources. And we'll look at their composition in terms of the identity of the fatty acids. Remember, all fats and oils have this basic structure. They just vary in how, how long the R group is and on how many uh, double bonds there are. Yeah? So as the number of, of double bonds increases, the melting point decreases? Yes, as the number of double bonds increases, the melting point decreases. Why do you suppose that is? Thanks for asking that, because I wanted to talk about that, but I forgot. I don't really know where that is. OK, great. I, I mean, uh, do I know what it is? Yes, I do actually. Okay, go ahead. Is it because like those cakes off the double bond limits the interaction between its molecules? Okay, you said that the that the that the uh, sorry cis double bond causes a kink in the molecule that might limit its ability to engage in those interactions. Let's let's have a look at that. Let's draw the 18 carbon chain with the 9Z double bond. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, double bond, 10, 9, 10, 11. Uh, what do we wanna do now? 12, 13, 14, 15, ah, dang it, I can't count. No. Well, dang it. I'm trying to figure out how to draw this in a way that communicates the point. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, something like that. Who knows? Right. So the presence of this double bond, you know that pi bonds you don't rotate around. And so that restricts the freedom of this chain. Uh, but it also bends the structure of the molecule. And I don't, I clearly haven't drawn this well, but a fatty acid that's fully saturated has none of those pi bonds. And so its chain is flexible, but it's also uh, oriented in a way that can rearrange itself such that two of these can pack against each other and their nonpolar tails can approach really closely. Recall that how close the nonpolar tails approach is related to the strength of the van der Waals interactions. Uh, if the fatty acid or the fat or the oil is composed of a lot of these unsaturated ones, they can't get quite as close together because you've got restricted freedom. And though I haven't drawn it, I think some people will draw, oh, here is a cis double bond. So it sort of bends the shape. All right, so yes, the double bond prevents the chain of the hydrocarbon from packing uh, as tightly against other hydrocarbons as the fully saturated chain can. And again, weaker van der Waals interactions means lower melting point. I think I pretty well murdered that in a bad way. So what questions do you have? Yeah. Is it also Is that 
Um, does it have to do with the pi bond preventing uh, an induced dipole from happening? I, I don't think so. I think uh, if you have a pi bond, the electrons are held further from the nucleus, and so that should actually increase your ability to polarize and do an induced dipole. I think it's mostly an issue of shape. And this is actually a big thing in biology and biochemistry. The shape of a molecule really matters. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, are you thinking about multiple fatty acids sort of spooning like this, or? No, no. No, okay. I was, I was thinking about, um, like, uh -huh. if you had, like, two saturated fats yeah. on the top and then one unsaturated fat on the bottom. Yeah. Then wouldn't, wouldn't it still be able to act like this? Right. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, these are still liquids, and of course that means that they don't have as much kinetic energy as they would if they were gases. So yes, you're right, Those, there, there is packing and interactions, they're just not as strong as for the fully saturated <coughs> ones. Because uh, the, the, the van der Waals or induced dipole interactions really do depend on the contact surface area between the molecules. And uh, what I'm saying here is the, uh, the double bond here makes it very difficult for these chains to approach each other as closely as they would need to to be solid. Yeah? So in this case, this is the unsaturated acid. Are we going to talk about trans fats too? Uh, do you want to? Trans fats? The problem is I don't know anything very much about the uh, epid or the uh, I don't know the biology of, of trans fats. I'll say a little bit about where they come from in a minute, if that's okay. Um, as with a lot of things in food, it may turn out to be mostly marketing, but um, there are some negative health consequences associated with with uh, trans fats. Though I haven't read a lot about them. I'm mostly, yeah. All right, so I'm going to show you uh, fats and oils, a few different natural sources for them, and what their composition of, uh, composition of those fatty acid chains in the triglyceride is. So uh, up here we have, and we're going to write number of carbons. We'll go 12, 14, 16, 18. 18 with double bonds, um, 9Z, and then 18 with, uh, let's see, the 9Z and 12Z. That's terrible, terrible penmanship. I, I know that we could be moving on to other things that I could put on the test. But one of my goals in this class is for you to understand the world around you at the molecular level. And so I feel like it's worth talking about molecules that you eat. Uh, so we'll start with animal fat or lard. Um, well, I served my mission in South Texas on the Rio Grande River. And there was a store there, I don't know if it was anywhere else in Texas, called HEB. Yeah, you know, we called it. It was a Spanish-speaking mission, but you're in the United States, so like you don't have to. And we called it La HEB. <laughs> um, anyway, they had these big five-gallon, or no, yeah, five-gallon, like you can get at Home Depot, buckets. I still remember them. Red lid, yellow bucket, and manteca. And uh, that's Spanish for lard, and that's what you need to make really good tamales. But um, animal, it's a solid at room temperature. Uh, and so composition of fatty acids that are saturated, 14 carbons, 25 carbons, and 15 carbons. Now go back up to our uh, table and you can see that, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean 25 carbons, I meant 25%. Sorry, dang it. 
14, 16, and 18, 25% 16 carbon, 15% 18. And if you go back up to our temperature uh, melting point, you know, these are gonna be very, very uh, solid. And then there is, uh, there's still a fair number of unsaturated fatty acids present, about 50% of the 9Z and about 60% of the doubly unsaturated fat. So um, presumably what they did is they took a sample of lard, they hydrolyzed all of those ester linkages and they analyzed what the fatty acids were and this was the composition. So you can see that even this relatively low percentage of saturated fats is enough to keep lard solid at room temperature. Um, olive oil, on the other hand, 1% uh, 14, 5% 16, 5% 18 in the saturated area, 80% 9Z and 7% uh, 9Z, 12Z. And then peanut oil, uh, is got the following composition, even more of that doubly unsaturated fat. All right. So, solids, liquids, fewer double bonds, more double bonds. And uh, now we should talk about this stuff, because you got peanut butter here, you got peanut butter here, this one's oily, this one's not. So what's the difference? Um, so, uh, and, and now I can tell the story about the tostadas. Um, my mom and dad moved to Lehigh from uh, Wisconsin uh, seven or eight years ago. And so we started having Sunday dinners together. My kids call it Grammy Sunday. Uh, I don't know where my dad fits in in all of that, but uh, <laughs> the main attraction is Grammy. And, uh, and one Sunday we were going to have tostadas with, you know, the grilled chicken and then a whole bunch of stuff to put on one of these chips that are in a circle. And uh, often, I don't know, uh, my, the older generation sometimes uh, has a hard time believing that the younger generation is competent. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, but, uh, but sometimes this, in this story I actually wasn't, <laughs> so whatever. Um, so we were supposed to bring the tostada shells, so I went to our pantry and grabbed the tostada shells and we uh, brought them to dinner and as we're eating, something doesn't smell and taste quite right. And it turns out I had picked up the really old tostada shells from our pantry instead of the newer ones. And uh, some of the oil had gone rancid. And so, yeah, so this was me not being competent. Uh, these have sat in my office for multiple years now. So if, we want, if you want, after class, you can come up. Never been opened. You can come up and smell it and see if they're gross. What is rancidity? Well, uh, if, for example, you ever carried a container of consecrated oil for two years in a very warm place and then opened it up afterwards and it stank, this is why. Um, double bonds, as you know, can be uh, the, uh, the pi bond can be the homo of a molecule. It's more reactive than sigma bonds. And one of the things that can happen, squiggly line here represents other parts of the molecule. One of the things that can happen over time in the presence of oxygen and uh, you know high temperature, you can actually oxidize the double bond, uh, oxidize a carbon adjacent to the double bond. We can talk about what this reaction is when we get to our chapter on radicals. But this doesn't taste very good. Um, and so this is what happens when oils go rancid. So you'll notice that uh, oils have limited shelf stability. Uh, and especially the more they've been exposed to oxygen, the more chances they're gonna have to go uh, rancid. Now, if you're selling food uh, and you can think of a way to prevent this from happening, you might have a better product. And so a long time ago, 
so this would be an example of what could happen to peanut butter that over time that uh, where there were double, a lot of double bonds present. Uh, there is a reaction you will learn in chapter 11, I think. Uh, you can take hydrogen gas and a palladium catalyst and you can add hydrogen across the double bond to turn something that was unsaturated into something that is saturated. And now it's not reactive to oxygen. It can't go rancid and therefore it has longer shelf stability. So uh, this process is called hydrogenation. Hydrogenation. Or, and if you look at the label on your peanut butter that's solid, ingredients, roasted peanuts, okay, got that. Sugar, no, no. Hydrogenated vegetable oil to prevent separation. Wow, they're educating us, that's cool. Um, <laughs> what they mean is they took this vegetable oil and they ran it over a catalyst in the presence of hydrogen and it got less liquidy and more solid-y and they could stir it up in the peanut butter and it won't separate out now because it's a solid. Um, so this was done a lot and it made it so that you could take your, uh, your cookies or your various uh, chips or treats and they could be sort of shelf stable for a really, really long time. Um, and this is still done. I mean, they still do it with peanut butter. Now here's where the issue of trans fats comes, comes in. <clears throat> the process of hydrogenation is somewhat reversible. If you run it to completion, you'll get the fully unsaturated product, but if you don't, some of the saturated product, you're now free to rotate around this, around this single bond. And so uh, if there's any chance for equilibrium, you'll form a mixture of the cis and the trans fatty acids. Now, nature doesn't make the trans fatty acids in general, makes cis, so this is something that your body doesn't normally see. Uh, as a trans double bond perhaps mimics more closely the extended structure of the fully saturated pi bond. And if you look at trans fat uh, melting points, they're higher. Uh, so trans fats are simply fats that have trans double bonds in them uh, because the hydrogenation process wasn't complete. Um, so Again, at some point in the recent past, uh, the food companies figured out that uh, they could advertise their products as being free of trans fats, and that would have the word fat and free very close to each other, and that might encourage people to buy stuff. Again, I don't know, I should know, every year I say I should know this, but I don't know about any of the, uh, the statistics as to what trans fats do to you long term. I think they are associated with negative cardiovascular outcomes. <clears throat> but in any case, you'll see people advertising that stuff's trans fat free now. And just so you know, to the FDA, trans fat free doesn't mean zero grams trans fat, it, or it does as long as you round down uh, less, than, less than 500 milligrams. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, it raises LDL, bad cholesterol, um, and, uh, and increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay, so now you know the story of the rancid tostada shells. Um, as I said, I bought these several years ago to illustrate stuff and it might be fun to open them up. They've never been opened. It might be fun to open them up and see what the shelf stability is. Shall we? <laughs> Not bad. Now it's going to get worse than we open them up. <laughs> okay. Um, so that ends chapter three. We spent more time on that than I wanted to, but I feel like that's a fairly important part of your everyday life that we ought to talk about.
All right, I'm going to switch off Notability now, and we're going to use a computer program. Uh, this is maybe a more effective way of trying to illustrate uh, the shapes of organic molecules. Chapter four, uh, in addition to introducing you to hydrocarbons, which we've already sort of talked about with nomenclature, is about um, the shapes of organic molecules. Of course, here you have methane, which is tetrahedral. We can add another carbon, <clears throat> and you now have ethane. Now, um, <clears throat> you know that you can rotate around carbon-carbon sigma bonds. And so uh, I think I can show you this process. Let's see. We want to keep this one fixed. All right, so you got carbon one there, carbon four there. Notice that um, carbon one, I'm sorry, that proton one and uh, proton four are directly opposite to each other. So the view, this is a side view of the molecule. <clears throat> this is a down the carbon carbon bond view of the molecule. Uh, this is called a Newman projection because it's called a projection because you're projecting a three-dimensional situation, basically condensing it onto a two-dimensional surface. Um, so you have to visualize the carbon in the front, which has a CH bond pointing down and a, whoa, CH bond pointing up. From our perspective in this two-dimensional uh, uh, projection, the angles between these two CH bonds, the, the angle is 120. Now we know in reality it's not, right? Because it's, it's actually tetrahedral, but you condense that to, to a two-dimensional projection and it looks like it's uh, got 120 degree angles. Um, and then you've got the carbon in the back. And notice how this proton in the back is in between these two protons in the front. That's called a staggered conformation. Uh, we also need to introduce a concept called dihedral angle. A dihedral angle is different from a bond angle. A bond angle is an angle between two bonds on the same atom. Here's the number down at the bottom, 109 and a half. A dihedral angle is the angle between two different, uh, two bonds on two different carbons. So, and you, it requires four atoms. Uh, it's the angle between those two uh, CH bonds, one, two in the front, three, four in the back. And you can see it's just about 60 degrees. Uh, dihedral angles have a mathematical definition. It's, a, it's vector math, basically. But uh, from our perspective, if you look down a carbon-carbon bond, the dihedral angle is the angle between two protons that you specify. Yeah? Right, if the compound's able to rotate freely, why do we even care? Um, great question. And for this molecule, for the most part, we don't. Other than to show you um, that there are two poss to possible shapes, uh, I'm going to rotate around this bond by uh, 60 degrees. And now you can see all the bonds in the front are lined up with those in the back. Okay, this is called an eclipsed conformation. And the eclipsed conformation is higher in energy than the staggered conformation that we just, uh, that we just drew. So this is an energy maximum, whereas this, I can't get to 60. close enough, whereas this is an energy minimum. <clears throat> so the important idea here is that not all shapes of the molecule, same molecule, but not all, these are called conformations, C-O-N-F-O-R-M, 
Asian, uh, they are not equal in energy. And this has a major impact on the structure of organic molecules as they get more complicated. Um, so we'll talk about why the staggered conformation is, le is more stable than the eclipsed conformation. The difference in stability is about three kilocalories per mole. And uh, at room temperature, there's plenty of kinetic energy to get, over that, uh, to get over that energy barrier. So let me sort of illustrate what we mean by this. Again, if we draw the molecule from the side, this is what it looks like to draw the staggered conformation from the side. The Newman projection involves you taking a view down the bond between carbons uh, one and two, oops. <laughs> Egregious waste of classroom time to color. All right, looking down the carbon-carbon bond with our uh, Sith eyes, we have, uh, we would see this. The carbon in the front, which we're gonna draw as a circle, uh, has three carbon hydrogen bonds. The carbon in the back also has three carbon hydrogen bonds. The dihedral angle between these two car between these two hydrogens, uh, blue and purple, is 60 degrees. And that is what we call an, a staggered conformation. <clears throat> And then we could draw the eclipse conformation simply by taking the carbon in the front and rotating, grabbing a hold of that blue proton and rotating it up to line up with the purple proton in the back. If we did that from the side, what we would see is this. <clears throat> And this is uh, what the eclipse confirmation would look like. Now, if we drew it straight on, we wouldn't be able to see the hydrogens in the back because they're lined up with the hydrogens in the front. Usually, you know, for completeness, we'll just draw them offset a little bit. Uh, right. And in this case, the dihedral angle between the CH bond blue in the front and the purple CH bond in the back uh, the dihedral angle equals zero. Theta there is my symbol for an angle. Uh, and this is an energy minimum. This is an energy maximum. And what I'm saying is that in order for this staggered conformation to uh, get to the alternative staggered conformation. And to, to really get this, you have to believe that we can label protons. Uh, we actually can experimentally, but if we labeled the proton and could tell the difference between these two conformations, what we would see is that they're both energy minima, but in order to get from here to here, I have to rotate through an energy maximum, which is the eclipse conformation. And so if we drew an energy diagram for this process where on this axis we have energy and on this axis we have dihedral angle, um, we would see a minimum here, a maximum here, and a minimum there. And this energy difference for the whole molecule is about three, as I said, kilocalories per mole, meaning that as long as your average kinetic energy of your molecule is about three kilocalories per mole, it's very easy to overcome this barrier. And so yes, at room temperature, you can rotate around that bond uh, and, and things work pretty well. Um, what we need to talk about now is what happens, whoa, not that. What we need to talk about now is what happens when you start adding other things to the two carbons in the front, because that's going to change uh, whether or not the two staggered conformations are equal in energy. 
All right, that's a lot of stuff. We'll continue with that on uh, Wednesday.